Hi, I'm Rachel Hernstadt. This is Book 12 of the Iliad, translated by Ian Johnston. And so, as Patroclus, Medeos' fine son, looked after wounded Eupolis in his hut, Trojans and Archaeans kept fighting on in clusters. The Danon ditch and the high, broad wall weren't going to hold out long. They built the wall, then dug the ditch around it to protect the ships and guard the ample plunder stored inside. But they built it without sanction from immortal gods. They had made no splendid offering, no sacrifices to the gods, asking them to keep their swift ships safe. So the wall soon fell apart. As long as Hector lived and Achilles' anger did not relent, and Priam's city was not captured, the huge Achaean wall remained intact. But after so many of the finest Trojans died, many Archaeans too. Though many did survive, in the war's tenth year, Priam's city was destroyed. When Archaeans sailed back to their dear native land, then Poseidon and Apollo planned to erase that wall by stirring up the raging power of all rivers flowing from Mount Ida to the sea. Rhesus, Hetaparis, Charisus, Rhodius, Grancius, Aespus, the sacred Scamander in Samois, where many oxhide shields and helmets had fallen in the dust, along with a race of people half divine. Phoebus Apollo merged the mouths of all these rivers then for nine days, drove the flood against the rampart. Zeus brought constant rain to wash the wall away and into the sea more quickly. And Poseidon too, the earth shaker himself, holding his trident, led the work. His waves eroding all foundations, wood and stone Archaeans had worked so hard to set there. He smoothed the shores of the fast-flowing Hellespent, covering huge beaches once again with sand. The wall gone, he changed the rivers so they flowed on as before, their lovely waters in their customary channels. All this Apollo and Poseidon would do later on. But then, the din of war round, raged round the sturdy wall. The battered timbers on the tower rattled. Argives, broken by Zeus's whip, were all hemmed in beside their hollow ships, held back by fear of Hector, whose powerful presence scared them, for, as before, he battled like a whirlwind. Just as some wild boar or lion faced the dogs, and huntsmen kept turning, confident of his strength, and men form in a line, preparing to go against the beast, hurling spears in volleys from their hands. Still it doesn't tremble, show any fear in its brave heart, but its courage kills the beast. Repeatedly it whirls itself around, threatening the ranks of men. That's how Hector then moved through the troops, urging men to attack the ditch and charge across it. But his swift-footed horses balked, standing at the very edge, neighing loudly, terrified because the trench was wide to cross. They could not easily jump over or get through. On both sides, there were steep banks along its length, with many large, sharp stakes driven in the upper edge, set there by Archaea's sons, as a protection against their enemies. There was no easy way horses pulling chariots with wheels could move across. Even men on foot were not sure they could move through. Then Polydamas, coming up beside bold Hector, said, Hector, you other leaders, you allies, it's foolish to think of driving our horses through this trench. It's difficult to get across with those sharpened stakes projecting from it, right by the Achaean wall. There's no way any charioteer could get down and fight. There's not much room. I think we'd get badly hurt. If high-thundering Zeus intends to help the Trojans and harm Archaeans, wipe them out completely, I'd prefer it happen that right away. So Archaeans all die here, far from Argos, unremembered. But if they turn us back, drive us from the ships, and trap us in the trench, and if Archaeans then reorganize, I don't think any of us will get back to our city with the news. But come, let's all agree to what I now propose. Attendants should hold the horses at the ditch. We'll arm ourselves with heavy weapons, then all follow Hector bunched up tightly. Our keens will not push us back. If it's true, they're already headed for destruction. What Polydamas had just proposed pleased Hector. With his weapons, he jumped from his chariot to the ground. The other Trojans did not hesitate, seeing him do that. They leapt quickly from their chariots and left them there. Each man told his charioteer to keep the horses in good order by the ditch. The men broke up in groups and organized themselves to form five companies, with each one following its own leadership. Some went with Hector and worthy Polydamas. They were the best and most numerous, especially keen to breach the wall and fight on at the hollow ships. Cerebrianus went on with them as third commander. 
Paris led the second group, along with Agenor and Alcathias. Hellenus and godlike Deophebus, two sons of Priam, led the third contingent with a third commander, warlike Aesius, son of Hyractus, whose huge horses had carried him all the way from Arisbe to the Celius River. The fourth group of warriors was headed by Aeneas, Anacius's brave son, Narcilochus and Achamus, two sons at Nor, well skilled in all elements of war. The famous allies Sarpedon led. He'd chosen to command with him Glaucus and warlike Astriopeus, for they seemed clearly the best of all the others, after himself, for among them all he was preeminent. These men linked themselves with sturdy bulls' hide shields, then, in their eagerness, made straight for the Danans. They thought no one could stop them as they charged the ships. Other Trojans and their famous allies followed what excellent Polydamus had said to them. But Aesius, son of Hyractus, leader of men, did not want to leave his horses or their driver, the attendant charioteer. He brought them with him as he went for the ships. The fool! He would not escape his grim fate and come back from the ships to windy Troy, proudly boasting of his chariot and horses. Before that happened, an unwelcome fate took him on the spear of Deucalion's proud son, Idiomenus. Aesius moved off to the left of the line of ships, where Archaeans used to pass with horse and chariot when returning from the plain. That's where he drove his chariot and team. He found the gates unbarred. Men had drawn the long bolt, and were holding them ajar, just in case they might save one of their companions escaping from the battle to the ships. At those gates, Aesius firmly aimed his horses. His men followed, shouting loudly. They brought Archaeans could hold out no longer. They th that they'd be assaulting the black ships. How wrong they were! For at the gates they found two men, two of the finest, proud-hearted sons of Lapith spearmen. One was Polypiotes, son of Perithus, and the other Leonates, a warrior like man-killing Ares. These two made their stand before the lofty gate. Like two high-topped mountain oak trees which defy wind and rain each and every day, anchored there by huge extension roots. Just like that, these two men, trusting the power in their arms, held their position as great Aesius approached. They did not run off. Holding bull's hide shields up high, with loud shouts, Aesius's men came straight for the well-built wall. Behold, behind Lord Aesius, Imenaeus, Orestes, Adamus, Aesius' son, Thun, and Onimaus. Up to now, the two Lapiths had been urging well-armed Archaeans from inside the rampart to defend their ships. But when they noticed Trojans charging the wall and Danans running off and shouting, the two men hurried out to fight beyond the gates like wild mountain boars taking on a confused mob of men and dogs attacking them. The beasts charged sideways, shattering trees around them, ripping out the roots, gnashing their teeth noisily till someone hits them with a spear and takes away their lives. That's how the shining bronze sounded on these two as they moved out against the flying weapons. But they fought bravely, relying on their strength and on those troops standing on the wall above them, who kept throwing rocks down from the sturdy tower, defending themselves, their huts, their well-built ships. Stones fell to earth like snowflakes, which some strong wind, pushing shadowy clouds, drives downward in a storm. So they strike the fertile earth. That's how thick and fast flying weapons rain down from Trojans and Archaeans. Helmets and bossed shields rang out as they were hit with the rocks the size of millstones. Then Aesius, son of Heractus, groaned in vexation, struck his thigh and cried out, Father Zeus, how you love to lie! I didn't think these warrior keans could withstand the force of our all-powerful hands. But they're like the yellow-banded wasps or bees who've made their home by some rough road and won't leave their hollow house but stay there, guarding their offspring from the hunting men. That's how these men refuse to yield the gate, though they're just two of them, until they kill us or are killed themselves. Aesius complained, but his words did not win over Zeus's mind, for in his heart he wished to give Hector glory. Other troops were battling on at other gates. It would be hard for me to report all these events, even if I were a god. 
for by that stone wall blazing, fires broke out everywhere. Though in distress, Archeans had no choice but defend their ships. Gods helping Danans in the fight were sad at heart. The two Lapiths now began to kill in earnest. Powerful Polypiotes, son of Perithis, with his spear struck Damasus through his cheek piece. The bronze helmet didn't stop the spear. Its bronze point tore straight through his skull, splattering his brains all through his helmet. That checked his fighting fury. Then he slaughtered Pylon, as well as Orminus. With his spear, Leonatis, Ares' assistant, hit Hi Hippomachus, son of Antipmachus, in his belt. Then, pulling out a sharp sword from its scabbard, he charged the Trojan mass, stuck in Pythases, hitting him at close range. So he lay there, on his back, motionless. Leonatis then struck down in quick succession, Menon, Amasius, and Orestes, all these lay prone there on the all-nourishing earth. While the two Lapis were stripping shining armor from the dead, young troops of Polydamus and Hector, the most numerous and bravest of the men, the ones most keen to breach the wall and burn the ships, so still stood along the ditch in some perplexity. For, as they dissembled, eager to cross the trench, a bird had gone above them, a high-flying eagle, moving past the left flank of the troops, gripping in its talons a huge blood-red snake, still alive, still struggling. It hadn't lost its will to fight. Doubling up, it struck the bird that clutched it beside the neck. The eagle stung with pain, let the snake fall down onto the ground, dropping it right in the middle of the crowd. Then, with a cry, it flew off downwind. Seeing that writhing snake lying there in their midst, Trojans shuddered. It was a sign, a powerful omen from aegis-bearing Zeus. Polydamus then approached bold Hector and spoke out. Hector, you're always taking me to task, though I give good advice in our assemblies. For you maintain it's not appropriate that someone else speak out against you, either in a council meeting or in war. For he should always back your leadership. But now I'm going to say what seems to me the best course we should take. Let's not advance to fight Danans by their ships. In my view, this is how all this will end. If that omen was sent to Trojans keen to cross the ditch, a high-flying eagle on our army's left holding in its talons a blood-red snake still living, which it let drop before it reached its nest, thus failing in its purpose to bring that snake back for its offspring, then, like that bird, if we, with our great strength, breach the gates in the Archean wall, and if Archaeans then retreat, we'll come back from the ships by this same route in disarray leaving behind many Trojans slaughtered by Archean bronze as they defend their ships. That's how a prophet would interpret this, someone who in his heart knew the truth of signs and in whom the people placed their trust. Hector, with his gleaming helmet, scowled and said, Polydamus, I don't like what you've just said. You know how to offer better comments. But if you're serious in what you say, the gods themselves must have destroyed your wits. You're telling me to set aside the plans of thunder-loving Zeus, what he promised, what he himself agreed to. You tell me to put my faith in long-winged birds. I don't care or even notice whether they fly off to the right towards dawn's rising sun or to the left towards the evening gloom. Let's put our trust in great Zeus's counsel, for he rules all mortals, all immortals. One omen is best. Fight for your country. Why are you afraid of war, of battle? Even if the others are all slaughtered by Archean ships, you need have no fear that you'll be killed. Your heart is neither brave nor warlike. But if you hold back from war or with your words convince some other man to turn away from battle, then you'll die struck by my spear. Hector finished speaking. Then he led his troops away. They followed him, making a huge noise. Thunder-loving Zeus then sent gusting storm winds down from Ida, driving dust straight at the ships to disorient the Archaeans and give glory to Hector and the Trojans. 
trusting Zeus's sign and their own power, they tried to force the great Archean wall, dragging down the tower's supporting beams, smashing parapets, prying up projecting columns Archeans had first put into the earth to shore up their wall's foundations. They dragged these back, hoping to undermine the wall. But even now, Danans did not back away. They repaired the parapets with leather hides, then hurled out weapons from there across the rampart at the attacking Trojans. The two Ajaxes moved back and forth along the wall, urging men on, firing up the fighting spirit in the Archeans. To some men, they called out words of encouragement. Others, the ones they saw clearly moving off, back from the fight, they taunted with abuse. Friends, whether you're an Archean leader or average, or one of the worst, for men are not all equal when it comes to battle. There's enough work here for everyone, as you yourselves well known. So let no one here turn back towards the ships. Now you've heard from your commander. Keep pushing forward, keep shouting to each other, so that Zeus, Olympian Lord of Lightning, may grant we beat off this attack, repel the Trojans, and drive them to their city. Shouting words like these, the Ajaxes incited the Archeans to fight on. As snowflakes on the winter's day fall thick and fast, when Counselor Zeus begins to snow to demonstrate to men his weapons, first he calms the winds, then snows steadily till he's completely covered high mountain peaks, jutting headlands, grassy meadows, fertile farms of men, shedding snow on harbors, inlets of blue-gray sea, where waves roll into push-back snow, while, from above, all the rest is covered over, when Zeus storms with heavy snow. That's how thick the stones fell then on both sides, some thrown on Trojans, some from Trojans on Archeans, the noise reverberated all along the wall. At that point, glorious Hector and the Trojans would not have crashed the gates or long bolts in the wall if Counselor Zeus had not stirred his son Sarpedon against Archeans like a lion going at short horn cattle. Sarpedon held his round shield in front of him, forged by a smith of beautifully hammered bronze, the inside formed of leather stitched in layers, held in place with golden wires encircling the rim. Holding this shield before him, brandishing two spears, he hurried forward like a mountain lion, long ravenous for meat, whose bold spirit pushes him to go even into the protected sheepfold to attack the flock. And even if he comes across herdsmen with dogs and spears guarding sheep inside, he won't leave the fold without making an attempt. So he springs on one, seizes it, or is hit himself in the fir first rush, by a spear by some swift hand. That's how guard like Sar Sarpedon's spirit drove him then, to assault the wall, break down the parapets. He called to Glaucus, Hippolochus' son, Glaucus, why are we two awarded special honors with pride of place, the finest cuts of meat, our wine cups always full in Lycia, where all our people look on us as gods? Why do we possess so much property by the river Xanthus, besides its banks, rich vineyards and wheat-bearing plowland? It so will stand and Lycian front ranks, and meet head on the blazing fires of battle, so then some well Lycian will say, they're not unworthy, those men who rule Lycia, whose kings of ours. It's true they eat plump sheep and drink the best sweet wines, but they are strong, fine men who fight in Lycian's front ranks. Ha, ah, my friend, if we could escape this war and live forever without growing old, if we were ageless, then I'd not fight on in the foremost ranks, nor would I send you to these wars where men win glory. But now... A thousand shapes of fatal death confront us, which no mortal man can flee from or avoid. So let's go forward to give the glory to another man or win it for ourselves. Sarpedon spoke. Without making any move, Glaucus agreed. They marched on straight ahead, leading their large company of Lycians. Seeing their advance, Menestheus, son of Pythios, shuddered, for they were aiming at his part of the wall, bringing destruction with them. He looked around at the Archean tower, hoping he might see some leader to protect his comrades from disaster. He saw both Ajaxes, so keen for war, standing there. Nearby was Teucer, 
who'd just come from his huts. But there was no way they'd hear him if he shouted. The noise was too intense. The din of smashed in shields, gates, and horsehair helmets. That sound reached heaven. The doors were now all barred. Men stood, stood outside them, trying to knock them down by force to pass on through. Menestheus quickly sent Herald Thutis to Ajax. Noble Thutis, run and call Ajax, or rather both of them if that's possible. That would be the best solution. Here we face complete destruction any minute now. Lycian leaders are pressing us so hard, the ones who previously in bloody fights have demonstrated their ferocity. But they're having trouble where they are, with fights breaking out. Let mighty Ajax, son of Telamon, come by himself and with him that expert Teucer. Menestheus finished. Thootes had heard him and obeyed. He ran along the bronze-clad Archean's barricade, then came and, standing by both Ajaxes, stood, spoke up at once. You Ajax, leader of bronze-armed Archeans, the son of Peteus, raised by gods, is calling you to go to him and help relieve the battle strain, if only for a while. And he'd prefer you both come. That would be the most, that would be the best solution. There they face immediate destruction. Lycian leaders are pressing them so hard, the ones who previously in bloody fights have demonstrated their ferocity. But if you're having trouble where you are, with fights erupting, then let mighty Ajax, son of Telamon, come by himself, and with him the expert archer, Tusher. Theotes finished. Great Telamonian Ajax then agreed. At once he spoke winged words to Oilin Ajax. Ajax, you and powerful Lycomedes, you both stay here. Stand firm. Rouse the nons to battle hard. I'll go over there, deal with that fight, and come back quickly, once I've helped them out as best as I can. That said, Telamonian and Ajax left. With him went Teucer, his brother, both from the same father. Pandion also went, carrying Teucer's curving bow. Moving along the wall, the three men reached the place where stout-hearted Menestheus stood. Here they found soldiers hard-pressed in the fight. The Lycians led on by powerful commanders. Their kings were climbing up the parapets like some black whirlwind. Ajax and the others jumped right into the fight. The noise grew more intense. Ajax, son of Telamon, was the first to kill a man, brave Epicles, companion of Sarpedon. Ajax hit him with a massive jagged rock lying inside the wall near the top. No man now alive could heft that stone in his two hands, not even someone young and strong. But Ajax raised it high, then hurled it, smashing the man's four-ridged helmet and completely crushing his entire skull. Epicles fell like a diver from that high tower, and his high spirit left his bones. Teucer struck mighty Glaucus, son of Hippoclus, with an arrow shoot from high, shot from high above on the wall as Glaucus was moving up. He hit him on the arm on a part he saw exposed. That stopped Glaucus's charge. He climbed back down the wall, but stealthily Sonarchian man could see that he'd been hit, and boast aloud about it. Sarpedon was upset as Glaucus's departure when he noticed it, but he did not neglect to keep up the attack. He lunged at Alcamon, Thester's son, speared him well, then yanked his spear back, which pulled Alcamon with it. He fell forward. His finely decorated armor, all of bronze, echoed as he crashed onto the ground. With his strong hands, Sarpedon grabbed the parapet and pulled. The whole construction fell apart, breaching the wall, creating a passage through for many men. Ajax and Teucer now advanced together to attack Sarpedon. Teucer had hit him with an arrow on the gleaming strap around his chest which held his protective shield. But Zeus defended his own son from deadly fates to make sure he'd not be destroyed by the ship's sterns. Ajax then jumped in, striking his shield. The point did not pass through, but its momentum knocked Sarpedon back in the middle of his charge. Sarpedon withdrew a little from the parapet, but did not retreat completely, for his heart was set on seizing glory. So he called out, rallying his godlike Lycians, You Lycians, why is your fighting spirit lessening? It's hard for me, although I'm powerful, to breach this wall alone and carve a pathway to the ships. So come, battle with me. 
The more men there are, the better the work done. Sarpedon called, fearing the censure of their leader. Troops made a heavy push around their counselor king. On the other side, the Argives reinforced their ranks inside the wall. For both sides, a major fight ensued. Lycians, though strong, could not break the Danon wall and cut their way through the ships. Danon spearmen could not push the Lycians back, repel them from the wall now they'd reached it. As two men with measuring rods quarrel over survey markers in a common field, striving for a fair division in some narrow place, that's how the parapet kept these troops apart. High on the wall, they hacked each other's armor, let their bucklers and large round shields around their chest, quivering targets. Many men were wounded, flesh slashed with pitiless bronze, those who turned those who turned aside and left their backs exposed while fighting, and those who hit right through their shields. Everywhere, along the wall, along the parapet, men's blood was spattered from Trojan and Archaeans. But even so, Trojans could not dislodge Archaeans from the wall. Just as industrious and honest woman holds her scales, a weight on one side, wool on the other, until they balance so they can glean a pittance for her children. That's how evenly the battle raged, until Zeus gave glory above all other men to Hector, son of Priam, who was the first man to jump inside that wall of the Archaeans. He raised a resounding yell, crying to his Trojans, Drive forward, you horse-taming Trojans! Breach that Argive wall! Then burn the ships with a huge fire! With these words, he drove them on, their ears all caught his call hurling themselves at the wall in a dense mass, gripping sharp spears, they began to climb. Hector picked up a rock lying before the gates, thick at its base, but tapering sharply on the top. Two of the best working men now living could not lever that stone of the ground easily into their cart, but Hector carried it with ease alone. Crooked-minded Kronos' son made it light for him. Just as a shepherd has no trouble carrying a ram's fleece in one hand, hardly noticing the weight, so Hector lifted up that rock, then carried it straight to the doors, guarding the strongly fitted gates, high double doors with the two cross pieces holding them inside, secured with a single bolt. Hector moved up closer, planted himself before the doors, his legs wide apart to throw with greater force, then hurled that rock right at the center of the doors. He smashed both hinges. The stone's momentum took it clear through the doors. The gates groaned loudly. The bolts were sheared right off. The impact of that boulder shattered all the planks. Glorious Hector, his face like night's swift darkness, leapt inside. The bronze which covered his whole body was a terrifying glitter. In his hand, he held two spears. Once he jumped inside the gates, no one moving out to stop him could hold him back, except the gods. From his eyes, fire blazed. Wheeling through the throng, he shouted to his Trojans to climb the wall. His men responded to his call. Some scaled the wall, others came pouring through the hole made in the gates. Danans were driven back among their hollow ships in a rout, and the noisy tumult never stopped. Thank you.